what I want to do is to give quite a clinical talk and try and explain how we're using the um, clinical trials data that we're generating, the biological material, to see if we can come up with some novel prognostic tools, really building on some of the excellent discussions that we've had already uh, to, to come up in that way. I'm particularly interested in the treatment of colorectal cancer, which is one of the commoner cancer types here in Qatar. And I'm in the enviable position now of having uh, a, a quite a significant degree of choice because of a huge increase in the number of available drugs over the past 10 years. Up until 10 years ago, we had one single cytotoxic drug, 5-fluorouracil. Now we have about a dozen different agents. And with choice uh, comes responsibility. And with that increasing diversity of drugs, what I want to be able to do is to try and harness the technology that we've heard discussed this afternoon to come up with cancer treatments which reduce toxicity and side effects and increase the possibility of the patient benefiting in some way. And the ways that I can do that are I can be a proper doctor, I can use clinical factors and look at the patient in front of me and examine them and make decisions on the basis of the patient that I see before me. Uh, I, I can do something on what the body does to the drug pharmacokinetics and that's around proper dosing. We'll talk about molecular markers and DNA and how there may be some tools and there may be some novel technologies that we can develop that, that may become products that would allow me to get the right patient for the right treatment at the right time. And again, we, we've all made the joke of omics. Um, clearly, we start still with histopathology. We still need to make the diagnosis of cancer, yes or no, and what grade or severity of cancer it is. So nothing for me uh, as yet has supplanted the uh, microscope as giving me the definitive information I need to make treatment choices. But I need to learn how to factor in all these new omics uh, into, so that we can come up with clever algorithms, as we've heard already, to try and make the right treatment decisions. And so let me give you a clinical example from one of our own trials. And this will tell us a little about how we can harness the power of large trials to make data available to our colleagues in the laboratory. And we must talk a little about statistics and mathematical handling of this. So this was the largest trial in the world that we'd done in colorectal cancer, <coughs> three and a half thousand patients. Half of the patients got chemotherapy and half didn't. And these were patients who had their primary colorectal cancer resected, so cured by the surgeon. But, but despite that, in 50% of patients, the cancer is still likely to come back. And therefore, I need to find a way of discovering which of those 50% of patients will be the unlucky ones to see if we can map the treatment appropriately. Now, this was uh, an experiment that took 10 years. And although this looks like a, two graphs which are almost indistinguishably superimposable, they're not. But what we did was, this was the first trial ever to show that there was a small but definite benefit for chemotherapy in the treatment of colorectal cancer in this setting. And it meant that we were curing an additional 4% of patients. Now, in, in, that, in this world, that may seem a sort of terribly attenuated experiment, all that effort to cure an extra 4% of patients. But in the world of cancerology, with the drugs we've got available, this was a sort of breakthrough, break out the champagne, excite, this was a sort of moment of extreme excitement for us. Okay. I'm overstressing that a little, but you get the point. Um, still, if we sort of deconstruct my excitement into the reality of what we've shown is that uh, we could pose a question on the basis of our trial results. Should all stage two colorectal cancer patients receive six months of complicated toxic chemotherapy? So I have to treat 100 patients. 80% of them will be cured by surgery on its own. Um, 4%, an additional 4% will be cured by chemotherapy. And that means that 16% of patients will still die despite the chemotherapy. Of that 100 patients, I'll kill one patient because of the side effects of chemotherapy, and 40 of those patients will suffer very serious side effects. So you see the balance of good and benefit is actually very, very subtle. And, and I'm representing this to you as a great victory and breakthrough in the world of cancerology. And what we need to be able to do is to see if we can come up with predictive or prognostic tools that, that in a way um, separate the cohort of patients I treat into those at high risk, intermediate, at low risk. 
If I had a tool, uh, whether it's RNA or protein or DNA, whatever, whatever the methodology was, that allowed me to define that low-risk group of patients, I wouldn't go near them with chemotherapy with a barge pole. I'd say, likely cured by surgery, go away, don't, don't sort of come anywhere near me. The high-risk group of patients, I, I would suggest that in those, the benefits of chemotherapy are likely to be a, an increased cure rate of around 10%. And I would say that it's almost mandatory to offer the high-risk patients chemotherapy and intermediate risk. I still don't quite know what to do about it. So if we had a tool that um, separated patients according to prognosis, how likely the cancer is to come back, and therefore gave, and also gave me a sense of which patients are most likely to benefit from, the, um, from chemotherapy, I'd be in a much stronger position to make a rational treatment decision uh, for the patient that I see in the clinic. So what steps have been taken to come up with new predictive or prognostic tools? Uh, this is work done in Howard McLeod's laboratory. This is the same group of colon patients that I treated in our, in our big uh, international trial. And this is using, looking at the, um, the RNA signature uh, using the Affymetrics technology. So with only 74 patients, and we'll come back to this because I find it difficult and again a recurrent theme has been how we use clever mathematical models to try and get the best out of data but to take um, you know 22,000 data points for a single patient and only to have 74 patients makes me feel that we're in danger of overfitting or over interpreting the data that we generate there were 31 relapses within three years uh, all of you have become increasingly um, aware and comfortable with um, segregating the RNA grids into, uh, into this tight through hierarchical, you know, very straightforward um, modeling. And what they did was they, they, they collapsed those 22,000 genes into a signature of 23 genes. It had an accuracy of 78% in predicting those patients in whom the cancer would recur. They then validated this in 36 patients uh, and again, you see here that the data suggests that it's a very good and effective way of identifying those patients who will relapse and those who will be disease-free with an extremely high odds ratio with a decent p-value. It's all done in frozen, uh, frozen, fresh frozen tissue. And nobody else has really been able to validate in the way that this was set up. This was first published in 2004. And no one's been able to repeat that, uh, that, that sort of experiment that... that um, that uh, Howard and the gang first did. This is a collaboration that we've got with Rene Bernards and the gang at the NCI in uh, Amsterdam. And uh, this is a, a directly collaborative piece of work that we've got, effectively trying to replicate the work that um, Howard and his colleagues did, um, but using a rather, a slightly different, um, a slightly different algorithm for understanding the, uh, how the RNA clusters around. Still fresh frozen tissue, still messenger RNA signature, and, and these are data that we haven't yet published. But this getting towards being able to separate a group of patients into the red dotted line who have a high risk of recurrence whom I would be uh, very compelled to treat, and the, um, solid, the solid line at the top, those patients who have a very low chance of relapse and whom I would consider cured by surgery and unlikely in any way to benefit from chemotherapy. And this is our training set, and we're currently validating these data in a larger data set of around 1,000 patients, and we, ha we haven't done that yet. But if we can replicate that training result in a much larger um, and therefore statistically more robust um, validatory set, that would be a very useful tool that I think would find its way uh, in, into use as a clinical product very quickly. A teeny bit in statistics, it, it's just, you know, as... As Javid said, I used to edit a magazine called Annals of Oncology, and I just get so bored seeing 100 patient studies and a new prognostic factor being churned out all the time. They're almost meaningless, that they're hypothesis generating in a sense. But what we really need to do is to get our acts together to do much larger studies and much larger quantities of biological material, because otherwise we're just not testing the hypothesis appropriately.